Um, retaining what was lost. This we're going to be hearing from Casey Russell. Cassie? Kasky. Kasky, sorry. And Yaduhu. Atlain Gunal Chish Lakai Yuhan Hai Adi. Thank you very much. My name is Kasky Russell. I um, come all the way from the University of Wyoming uh, yesterday to, to be here. So thank you for having me here. Uh, special thanks to all the people that organized it um, and to Zachary Jones and to Lance Twitchell for getting in contact with me and uh, communicating with me uh, via email with me. I'm going to present uh, my grandmother um, wrote a memoir in the late 90s. Uh, it's unpublished, but I'm working on getting it published. Uh, she was born and raised in Klawak, so I have a lot of pictures. If you, uh, if it's, if you can't see very well back there, why don't you move up? I have some pictures and quotes from her memoir of early 20th century in Klawak, and uh, and then I'll read a little bit. Uh, hopefully, won't take up too much of your time. Uh, the impetus for this presentation comes from two desires, really, one personal and one academic. I want to share my grandmother's story. Uh, she was a remarkable Klingit woman from Klawak, and I also want to engage in some of the comments she made in her memoir that have kind of, I've puzzled over for some time. Um, so I hope as you learn about T.U., T -U, it was her Klingit name, you will also learn about the cultural issues with which she wrestled. So. I'm going to hold it like that. Is that better? <laughs> Sorry. I don't have to be leaning over so much. So that's my grandmother to you, circa 1920 in Cloak. All the quotes in here come straight from her memoir. Her memoir is about 80 pages. Like I said, I'm working on getting it published. Um, hopefully that will be out soon. I was born May 19th, 1916 on a small island in southeastern Alaska. The island was off the northern tip of the Prince of Wales. On this island was the Indian village of Kowak. Klingons believe strongly in reincarnation. Our Indian names were given to us with the conviction that we returned the person we were named for. My name, Tiu, came from a woman who died shortly before I was born. She was an outsider, having come from another village. She had cut her finger quite badly before she died. When I was born, there was a red mark that persisted a while on an identical, identical figure on my hand. So the midwife, my great-grandmother, Kitty Collins, announced that I was Tiu returned to life. It was told of the village, and Tiu's family from then on treated me with love and respect. It was always a good feeling knowing that I possessed the spirit of such a beloved person. So that's where she got her Clinket name from. Her English name was Amelia Smith originally. She's part of the Pradovich family. Um, and then when she married my grandfather, it was Amelia Kasky. That's where I get my name. There's the house in Kowak. There is Tiu there, and there's my Aunt Mary right there. And to your rights, the other day, I was looking through some old pictures I've been collecting to use with my story. I came across one that I had not seen for a long time. It was a picture of our house. I was surprised to see how old and shabby it was. In my recollections, I remember our home being warm, cozy, and inviting. This is certainly an illustration of the saying that it's in the eye of the beholder. Our house did not... Our house did fit the standard for homes in Klawak. It ranked above, it ranked about average. The two nicest homes belonged to the teachers and were owned by the government. <laughs> I've got to keep an eye on my time here. My uh, Aunt Mary is still alive. She's in her mid-90s. Um, she lives in Washington. If you're familiar with the book, uh, Quoth the Raven, she is the little girl buying ice cream in the pictures there. And little Mary, it says something like, Little Mary Smith buying ice cream from the ice cream seller. Yeah. Uh, I know that book had a lot of problems with it, but my grandmother loved to look at the pictures. Um, and the, uh, Mary is also discussed in that book, saying that she didn't understand what she called uh, all of her first cousin's sister. And the author says, obviously this young girl doesn't know what the meaning of sister is. Of course, the writer didn't know, have any idea what the clinket meaning of sister was, right? There's um, Tiu, Mary, and my great-grandmother, Josie Pradovich. And my grandmother writes, my mother, Josephine, was an amazing woman I admired a lot. Um, 
She had a green thumb. Sewing and beading moccasins occupied many of her evenings. She made hundreds of moccasins. Uh, the skins were most often seal skin. Seals were plentiful in Kowak Harbor. Mom would stretch and fit the seal skin over the wooden frame. The frame was strong and sturdy. We would take a tool shaped from iron with a wooden handle. The frame was propped against the wall on an angle. Then you'd scrape away at the skin, and every now and then you'd rub corn starch on it, bearing down hard until the skin was soft and pliable. The starch made the skin underside nice and white. I still have some of my great-grandmother's moccasins and her patterns that she used to make moccasins. Um, and she also uh, left a lot of beads, but I gave those, I gave those away. This is uh, Josie Pradovich, her sister Mabel, and their mother, Mary Scon, around 1920 uh, in front of Mary Scon's house in Kowak. And my grandmother writes, the house I liked to visit the most was my grandmother's house. The house was right next, to doors, right next door to ours, built up from the ground. I visited my grandmother every day. She probably influenced me more than any other person. She was born in 1864 while Alaska was still under Russian rule. She died of cancer at the age of 62 in 1926. She was ill and feeble during the last years. She was often in bed when I came to see her. During the years that she was active, she spent a lot of time teaching me to sew, knit, and crochet. The house was tops, according to Kowak standards. The wall in the parlor had a very attractive hanging, a red and bla black and red blanket, which had a large design of a large eagle done with white buttons. Yeah. There's T.U.'s family in Kowak. Um, this is her older brother. Uh, his name is Allie, uh, Buster, Mary, and T.U., and that's the parents. Um, I forget her, her dad's name is Edward and Josie. And she writes, I grew up in a changing culture. Displaying pride in such a background is a relatively new phenomenon. At a crucial time in my life, I moved from a primitive lifestyle of living to a modern one and lived amongst among vastly different people. I had known only a few white people. In my village, there were only less than half a dozen people who were about my age, but I don't feel I was deprived or lacking opportunities because we lacked things and activities that were available in a modern town. I think that the freedom we enjoyed, the relaxed lifestyle, the closeness and caring received gave me a tremendous background for the life I had. When she was in her 20s, she was selected by the BIA to go to Western Washington University, then a state normal school. Um, she was given a scholarship to become an educator with the hopes that she would return to Kowak and teach at the mission school. In, in Bellingham in the 1930s, she uh, met my grandfather, who was a professional boxer. Um, she got pregnant, and the university and the BIA took her scholarship away, and she ended up living in Bellingham for most of the rest of her life. So uh, the goal that the BIA had for her to become a, uh, even though she only had a few years of school, in Kowak um, and didn't speak English all that well, they still sent her to Washington State Normal School to get an education. So she was there for about a year and then she had to uh, drop out because of loss of scholarship. Here is a uh, Kowak grade school in 19, circa 1922. Unfortunately, uh, so one of the things I inherited along with the memoir was um, probably a hundred 110 pictures of Kowak in the 1920s. My grandmother wrote um, names of who these people are. Most of the people are on the back, um, but some, a lot of the pictures she forgot who these people were. This picture, uh, T U is right back here next to her cousin, Ethel Roberts. Um, she writes in her memoir a lot about her friends growing up in the village. So unfortunately, this is one of the pictures. I don't know who all the, the, uh, the kids are in here. Here's what T.U. has to say about the school in Kowak. Kowak School was run by the government and was called the Government School. The curriculum and staffing was a responsibility of the BIA. The village was much too small to support an independent school system. I'm not sure of the number of students enrolled. I would guess there were between 30 and 40 students, grades 1 through 8. Our school house was located a few yards up on the beach, which caused endless distractions as we could watch the boats going in and out of the bay. Around the backside was located outdoor privies and two divergent paths, one leading to the boys and the other to the girls. Both were in full view of the schoolhouse. Needless to say, you had to be pretty desperate before you asked permission to go. She um, completed parts of grades, I think, two, three, six, and eight, and then uh, a little bit of high school. 
and then was sent to the uh, to Bellingham to the college. Here's her uh, two older brothers who were sent away to Chamawa when she was um, just a little little girl. She writes in her memoir, my brothers were away at boarding school at the time of my earliest memories. This is my uh, great uncle Ali and my great uncle Buster. I like this at Chamawa, they would give them clothes, um, haircut, um, and then they'd send these postcards back home to the uh, village to show, uh, show the people back in the village what the kids looked like. I think my grandmother's family, my grandmother didn't visit Chamawa, but in the eight years that these two were in Chamawa, uh, my great-grandma Josie was able to visit one time. So they're gone for quite a while. Um, but they would get, periodically get postcards like this from Chamawa. And on the back of the postcard, my uncle Ali writes, to mother, instead of from, right, he's learning how to write here, form Ali Smith. And my grandmother's written Buster and Buster in Chamawa. I think this is probably 1923, 25, somewhere around there. Yeah. This is... To use Uncle Frank Pradovich in Chamawa about the same time, on the same type of postcard. Uh, pretty handsome dude. Here's a picture I love the uh, girls of Kloak sunbathing, circa 1930. Um, my grandmother has written who these, who these women are. You guys might know some of these names. Um, T was there. Right next to her is Elizabeth Wanamaker. She'd become Elizabeth Pradovich. That was T.U.'s aunt. Um, she would marry T.U.'s uncle. Uh, and there's Margaret Roberts, Helen Pradovich. And she writes, Aunts Mabel and Bertha. And I think that's probably Mabel and Bertha Pradovich, but I don't know for sure. Um, Mary Smith, the little girl. That's my Aunt Mary. Um, some bathing on the beach in Kowak. And she writes about uh, her aunt and uncle a little bit. So the early missionaries were the Reverend David Wagner and his wife. The missionaries I remember that followed the Wagners were the Bromleys and the Petersons. Reverend Wanamaker was the last one before I left. He was the first native minister. He was a Klingit and spoke with an accent typical of the Klingits from farther north of Kloak. He and his wife arrived with their adopted daughter, Elizabeth, an attractive girl. She attracted the local fellows, the local young fellows, and ended up marrying my uncle Roy Pradovich. And there's Uncle Roy with the ball right there. I don't know where this picture is taken. Anyone recognize this? Is this Sitka? Yeah. And unfortunately, my grandmother didn't write the names of the other folks on there, so I apologize for not knowing them. Some of you might, might know them. Um, this is Stanley Pradovich, uh, Eddie Smith, and Stanley's nephew. My grandmother couldn't remember Stanley's nephew's name, so I apologize for that. Um, Stanley lived on Bainbridge Island for many years, and I, I was close with him, um, Stanley Pradovich. And my uncle Eddie Smith lived down in Washington, too, for many years. Uh, and then my grandmother writes, they're on the boardwalk here in Kloak, one of the main streets in Kloak. And so my grandmother writes, the original cannery was built right near our house. It burned down and its replacement was built across the bay. The majority of laborers that were brought in were Chinese men. And my grandmother, even when she was old, she could, uh, knew some Chinese phrases, mainly dirty ones, um, but uh, she could remember some Chinese from her 20 years in Kloak. Many couldn't speak English. They were always good to his children, and on many evenings they would row across the bay and join the natives in the evening ritual in Kloak. I like this part Im immensely. Uh, my grandmother always say, without TV, without radio, every night all the inhabitants of Kloak would just walk the boardwalk and greet everybody. And these Chinese laborers would often row over in their boats and join on this walk around town. Right. It was, uh, the ritual had everyone get out and go for a walk around town. It was where you met your neighbors, friends, and exchanged greetings. We children delighted in following behind the groups of Chinese, imitating their walk and their chatter. And there's her great-grandparents, um, Kitty Collins and Tecumseh. Uh, Kitty is originally from Kuyu, 
uh, Kuyo Kwan, she uh, escaped the uh, smallpox epidemic when she was just a teenager in the 1830s, 1840s, and eventually uh, ended up living in Kowak, uh, where her daughter Mary Scon and granddaughter Josie Pradovich and Amelia were born. And my grandmother writes, by the time I was born, Klingets were trying hard to change into the white man's style of living. This was disastrous as far as their health was concerned, as they were made to be ashamed of the types of food they ate and adopt the white man's menu. She was certain, um, and she had good right to be, that the uh, change in diet um, was the main cause of ill health for Clinkets. And uh, she writes, um, so most of my generation died off from tuberculosis. That was followed by the problem of alcoholism, which is still a problem. When people were shamed and made fun of the eating their natural foods, they fell prey to illness and started dying off. In olden times, the average age of the tribe and death at death was in the 90s, and many were 100 years or older. My great grand my great grandmother lived to be 110, and that's Kitty. Um, by my generation, all that was changing. And then she writes about. Uh, I just picked some selections to show you guys, and um, this is one on, on health care, but also uh, on the native native medicine. The school, the village had a nurse put there by the government. Her office was in the schoolhouse. She took care of the people. As a school children, we would line up daily in her office and take a spoonful of cod liver oil with nothing to go with it. Indian children were taught to obey. It was a disgrace to argue or cry. Once a year, a government ship came in with a doctor and medical supplies. It seemed like everyone was getting tonsils out or having teeth pulled. If one became seriously ill, a boat would take them to catch a can or Juno. But the natives secretly still used the shaman or medicine man. He was never mentioned to white people. His work was kept secret from outsiders. He was always available to us. Somehow I learned that his existence was never to be revealed to the whites or his practices discussed. As a child, I was ill a lot, and I remember going on one long siege especially. My grandmother was ill too, so I was up at her house. The shaman came in, performed some rituals, then he gave me some medication. I soon did get better, but my treatment by the shaman was never discussed with outsiders. So in, at least in the 20s and 30s, the uh, natural native medicine was still being practiced in Kluwak. And there she is, a few years before she passed away, having an annual herring egg feast. Where her relatives sent us herring eggs down from Kluwak in seaweed, and it was a wonderful thing. This is in Washington. And she writes, um, the ingrained philosophy of the Klingets is to honor, is the honor accorded to one giving gift, the gifts. You were never a guest in at the house of a villager and left without receiving a gift. The gift was usually food, a special piece of fish, some berries, seaweed, or once in a while some article would be given. To this day, it's very hard for me to have a guest leave my house without a gift. It's usually something I've cooked, canned, or made. And that was pretty much true. Even when I had friends come over, she would all give us, she would, line up gifts of uh, bags of food to give away and, and my friends would wonder what's going on here and I'd say just accept the, the food. <laughs> and she writes some, I don't want to take up all our time, I'm going to stop here real quick. Um, she writes some pretty interesting stuff about her perceptions of the massive changes over the 20th century that happened to Clinkett's. Um, looking back, again, this is, you know, looking back over her life. And she says, I was born into a culture that no longer exists. Kowak hasn't changed drastically, but there are distinct changes in the lifestyle and the habitants. I've always puzzled, this has always puzzled me. Um, I've wondered what she meant by that for a long time. As I look back and contemplate those early years, I can appreciate the uniqueness of my childhood upbringing, a lifestyle that has gone, erased by the inevitability of becoming a civilized community. Throughout her uh, memoir, she um, really questions this notion that, uh, of civilization and what happened to her. Some would call it progress. I can't help but wonder when I see a vibrant, energetic population proud of their homes and families has been replaced by a great deal of apathy, despair, and alcoholism. Um, she questions these, all these notions of progress. It has only been a short time that pride in themselves, their heritage, and their land has been reestablished. They are striving to regain what they lost when the white man's civilization swept through, bringing it with it contempt for their native lifestyle and philosophy. In striving to please, fit in, and be accepted, natives lost their identity and were bewildered, confused, groping individuals trying to find out who they were. Kowak then affords a unique opportunity to trace what has happened and to appreciate the strides that are now made, being made by the people who only recently are developing their pride and dignity that has suddenly been lacking. I am filled with pride when I say Klingit's proclaiming that. I am Klingit and I am proud of it. I say to myself with a warm good feeling, I am proud of you, my brothers and sisters, more power to you. 
she would say too that the language is the uh, key to the culture and um, she would be happy to see what has gone on with language revitalization. I worked with her before she died to learn the language myself, but then I gave it up after she passed away. I stopped trying to learn it, but um, thanks to uh, the work that you guys have done, online courses and all the uh, work that Dowen Howers and everybody has done, uh, even people living in Wyoming can start keep learning the Clinkett language. So I've started again this semester to pick it up once again. Anyways, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Sorry for going so long.